Chapter 13 The Pedophile Pirate When the prophet married Asia, she was very young and not yet ready for consummation. Chairman Mohammed settled into his public housing project and immediately began to act like the fool he had become. Ishak, in the year of the prophet's arrival, Abba Uama died from a rattling in the throat. The messenger said, His death is an evil thing for the Jews and the Arab hypocrites, for they are sure to say if Muhammad were really a prophet, his companion would not have died. But truly I have no power with Allah, either for myself or for my companions. Truer words were never spoken. Muhammad had no morals either. Tabati. The prophet married Asia in Mecca three years before the Hijra, after the death of Khadija. At the time, she was six. Ishak. When the apostle came to Medina, he was fifty-three. Tabati. In May 623 A.D., or A.H. 1, Allah's messenger consummated his marriage to Asia. He would be dead in ten years. She hadn't even lived that long. Pedophilia was, and continues to be, child abuse. The abused had come full circle. He was now an abuser. Accusing a prophet of being a pedophile sounds outrageous, yet the evidence is undeniable. Tabari, when the prophet married Asia, she was very young and not yet ready for consummation. This is how it all happened. Tabari, my mother came to me while I was being swung on a swing between two branches and got me down. My nurse took over and wiped my face with some water and started leading me. When I was at the door, she stopped so I could catch my breath. I was brought in while Muhammad was sitting on a bed in our house. My mother made me sit on his lap. The other men and women got up and left. The prophet consummated his marriage with me in my house when I was nine years old. Given a choice, I believe most people would prefer to get their spiritual inspiration from someone who isn't a sexual predator. Muhammad struggled to justify this behavior. Bukhari the prophet said, A virgin should not be married till she is asked for her consent. O oh, apostle, how will the virgin express her consent? He said, By remaining silent. Allah's apostle told Asia, You were shown to me twice in my dreams, also known as sexual fantasies. I beheld a man or angel carrying you in a silken cloth. He said to me, She is yours, so uncover her. And behold, it was you. I would then say to myself, If this is from Allah, then it must happen. Allah not only approved pedophilia, He insisted upon it. That makes the Islamic God as perverted as His prophet. Since 53-year-old pedophiles are not prophet material, I want to give Islam every opportunity to clear this up. The next hadith is from Asia. Tabari there are special features in me that have not been in any woman except for what Allah bestowed on Miriam bit Imran. She was referring to Mary, the mother of Yeshua, although she didn't know her name or her father's name, and none of the features actually applied. Amram is actually the father of Moses, with Miriam, or Mary, being Moses' sister. Mohammed got confused and erroneously attributed Moses' father to Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. I do not say this to exalt myself over any of my companions. What are these? someone asked. Asia replied, The angel brought down my likeness. She was a babe. The messenger married me when I was seven. My marriage was consummated when I was nine. She was abused. He married me when I was a virgin, no other man having shared me with him. She was a child. Inspiration came to him when he and I were in a single blanket. A baby inspired him. I was one of the dearest people to him. A verse of the Quran was revealed concerning me when the community was almost destroyed. She inspired Allah. And I saw Gabriel when none of his other wives saw him. She lied. Think about the implications of what Asia just said. 
Muhammad was inspired. A Quran surah was handed down while the Prophet was having sex with a little girl. Allah didn't find pedophilia the least bit troubling. The following confirms that the first Muslims were consumed by greed. The Prophet was inspired by the body of a child, and the circumstances surrounding the Quran revelations are as perverted as the scriptures themselves. Bukhari The people used to send presents to the Prophet on the day of Aisha's turn to have sex with him. Aisha said his other wives gathered in the apartment of Umm Salama, wife number two, and said, Umm, the people send presents on the day of Aisha's turn, and we too love the good presents just as much as she does. You should tell Allah's apostle to order the people to send their presents to him, regardless of whose turn it may be. Umm repeated that to the Prophet, and he turned away from her. When the Prophet returned to Um, she repeated the request again. The Prophet again turned away. After the third time, the Prophet said, Um, don't trouble me by harming Asia, for by Allah, the divine inspiration, that would be Quran surahs, never came to me while I was under the blanket of any woman among you except her. If there have been any skeptics who have made it this far without acknowledging that the Quran was inspired to satisfy Muhammad's cravings rather than to save men's souls, welcome to the realm of reason. Earlier I accused the victim of pedophilia of lying. I want to explain why. Her eighth divine gift was contradicted during one of the bedroom revelations. Bukhari The Prophet said, Asha, this is Gabriel. He sends his greetings and salutations. Aisha said salutations and greetings to him and Allah's blessings. Addressing the Prophet, she said, You see what I don't see. This hadith reveals how perverted Muhammad was and how sane other Arabs were by contrast. Bukhari I participated in a ghazwa, which would be an Islamic raid, with the Prophet. I said, Apostle, I am a bridegroom. He asked me whether I had married a virgin or a matron. I answered, a matron. He said, why not a virgin who would have played with you? Then you could have played with her. Apostle, my father was martyred, and I have some young sisters. So I felt it not proper that I should marry a young girl as young as them. It's obvious who corrupted whom. Muhammad's behavior would be considered criminal in every civilized nation on earth. No moral society has ever condoned old men having sex with young children. If you are caught, you're locked up, separated from decent people. Pedophilia is so heinous, convicted felons torment child abusers. Even they can't stand to be in their presence. Such a grotesque act disqualified Mohammed from his alleged calling. What's more, his personal perversity had a lasting legacy. Muslims follow his example. While most of what happens in the Islamic world escapes our purview, as Islam is hostile to all freedoms, including press and inquiry, we have gained glimpses in Afghanistan and Iraq. There, virginal young girls are frequently raped by Muslim men. And as you would expect in a culture influenced by Muhammad, the victims are shamed, not the perpetrators. It's little wonder Muhammad's contemporaries call him mad, insane and demon-possessed. It is little wonder Islamic clerics try so hard to hide this stuff from the world. It is why Muhammad assassinated a score of poets, the journalists of their day, who had the courage to expose him. It is why Muslim rulers issue fatwas today. Decadent egomaniacs like Muhammad are deeply troubled and tortured souls. Their insecurities drive unbridled lusts for power, sex, and money. Their feelings of inadequacy cause them to be shy, yet their outward manner overcompensates, making them abusive and purposefully deceptive. They need others to bow down to them in submission, and they require unquestioned obedience. Muhammad was a textbook case, as was Adolf Hitler, his modern twin. Bukhari the prophet was shyer than a veined virgin girl. Allah's apostle said, Whoever obeys me obeys Allah, and whoever disobeys me disobeys Allah, and whoever obeys the ruler I appoint obeys me, and whoever disobeys him disobeys me. 
pedophilia, incest, and rape are all perverted manifestations of a thirst for power and control. Insecurity is often the cause. I apologize for dragging you through this muck. I realize the material we just covered would be illegal, even in a pornographic movie. And we are not done. We have yet to deal with the prophet's other depravities, incest and rape. But at least you know why this control freak's paradise was a brothel filled with ever-attentive young virgins ready to be conquered. Muhammad, like his religion, was fixated on the flesh. According to the Quran, bodies were reassembled so that the skins could be singed in hell and teased in paradise. Man's spirit was incidental. I believe this is because the religion was made in the Prophet's image. It reflected his character and desires. To appreciate Islam's elevation of body over soul, we must look at the source of his inspiration. Muhammad was right when he described the angel that visited him as a slave. Bukhari So Allah conveyed the inspiration to his slave, Gabriel, and then he, Gabriel, conveyed it to Muhammad. Angels, fallen or heavenly, demonic or godly, have no choice. To borrow another line from Islam, they must submit and obey. Islam's dark spirit knew all about angelic submission, because he once was one. Quran 7, verse 11. It is we who created you and gave you shape. Then we ordered the angels to fall and prostrate themselves to Adam. The same passage goes on to correctly implicate Satan and suggest angels are eternal. Quran 7, verse 19. Satan said, Your Lord only forbid you this tree, lest you should become angels, immortal, living forever. Satan, like all angels, is a four-dimensional construct. That is to say, he can maneuver in time, the fourth dimension. While this may sound complex, we have known since Einstein that space has a fourth axis, an infinite aspect we cannot yet navigate. In this regard, angels are superior to men as we are trapped in three-dimensional bodies, stuck in time. Yahweh is not, which is why his name means I am or I exist. He is immortal and timeless. His infinity exists in the fourth dimension. This is how Yahweh predicts the future. He knows the future not because he has ordained it, but because he has already been there and witnessed the culmination of our choices. Now put yourself in Satan's wings for a moment. He knows that his spirit is inferior to ours for two reasons. We are made spiritually in God's image. We have choice. With choice, we have the capacity to be creative and to love. This is why God created us. These attributes remain his and our most powerful qualities. So Satan doesn't want to compete with us spiritually. There he cannot win. But when he competes bodily, he cannot lose. We are three-dimensional, he is four. The difference is infinite, just as it is between the two and three axis realms. The comparison is like a cartoon rendering of Mickey Mouse competing with Walt Disney, or more accurately with Walt's secretary. This is why Islam is focused on the body. It's why the covetous Muhammad was the perfect satanic prophet. The arrival of the first child born to the Muslims after the Hijra was celebrated. Tabari. The messenger's companions cried, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater or greatest. Therefore, greater than Yahweh is the implication. When she was born... This was because the story was circulated among the Muslims that the Jews claimed that they had bewitched them so that no children would be born. The Muslims praised Allah that he had falsified the Jews' claim. They were saying that their God's magic spells were more powerful than the Jewish God's. Even if they were right, it made Islam wrong. The next seven section heads in Tabati's the foundation of the community. Begin with Expedition. The Arabic word is Magazi, which is translated Raid in the Sirah. It actually means invasion. It is synonymous with Jihad. 
defined by Bukhari as holy fighting in Allah's cause. A more complete explanation is provided in the Book of Jihad on page 580 of Maktaba Dar as Salam's publication of Sahih al Bukhari. Jihad is holy fighting in Allah's cause with full force and weaponry. It is given the utmost importance in Islam and is one of its pillars. By jihad, Islam is established. Allah is made superior and He becomes the only God who may be worshipped. By jihad, Islam is propagated and made superior. By abandoning jihad, may Allah protect us from that. Islam is destroyed and Muslims fall into an inferior position. Their honor is lost, their lands are stolen, and Muslim rule and authority vanish. Jihad is an obligatory duty in Islam on every Muslim. He who tries to escape this duty dies as a hypocrite. Memorize this paragraph. Shout it out to all who will listen. Every word was derived from the Quran. Every word was lived by Muhammad. It accurately represents fundamental Islam. So much so, each of the 150 hadiths that follow this definition of jihad speak of fighting. None suggest a spiritual struggle. Among them, Muhammad says that the most important deed is jihad, fighting in Allah's cause. In Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 52, Number 44, and the Quran agrees, saying peaceful Muslims are hypocrites, destined for hell. They are the worst of creatures, the most vile of animals. You will find this in Quran Surahs 3 and 33. So that there is no question regarding the appropriateness of using Bukhari as a source, here's what the Islamic scholars had to say in the preface. Al Bukhari's hadith is the most authentic and true book of the Prophet. The translator said, "I am perfectly sure that the translation, with Allah's help and after all the great efforts exerted in its production, has neared perfection." The imams from the cradle of Islam. The Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia said, "It has been unanimously agreed that Imam Bukhari's work is the most authentic of all the other sources in Hadith literature put together. It is second only to the Quran." That leaves you and me at the crossroads of destiny. If we don't deal with the awesome gravity of Islamic jihad, our future will vanish before our eyes. If we wish to avoid the abyss of world war. We must expose the doctrine committed to world conquest. We must liberate Muslims from Islam. The expedition led by Hamza was the first Maghazi. Hamza, a huntsman in Mecca, was now a muhajid, plural of mujahideen, a Muslim warrior in jihad. Tabari, in Ramadan, seven months after the Hijra. Muhammad entrusted a white war banner to Hamza with the command of thirty immigrants. Their aim was to intercept a Quraysh caravan. Seven months after fleeing Mecca in shame, the pedophile prophet has become a pirate and terrorist. So that there is no misunderstanding, let's define these less than admirable characterizations. Pirate is a renegade who, along with others under his command, uses force of arms to steal the property of others. A terrorist is a person who violently attacks civilians, destroys their property, and disrupts their economy as a means to achieve a political objective. The flag Muhammad handed to Hamza was a war banner. It was one of the many symbols the Prophet stole from his patriarch Kusay. Hamza was a warrior. He was given command over thirty men. Their aim was to intercept a caravan. A civilian economic enterprise owned by the people Muhammad had promised to slaughter because they had teased him. Although we are told they separated without a battle, the intent was piracy and terror. Their failure did not change what they had become, what Islam had done to them. At this point in the Prophet's career, there were simply more good guys than there were bad guys, and he was as inept as a pirate. As he was as a prophet. Turning to Muhammad's biographer, we learn more about the mindset of the first Muslims. Ishak, Hamza's expedition to the seashore comprised thirty riders, all emigrants from Mecca. 
He met Abu Jal, who had three hundred riders. Amar intervened, for he was at peace with both sides. Hamza, Muhammad's raider, said, So they allege, wonder at good sense and at folly, and at lack of sound counsel and sensible advice. Their people and property are not yet violated, as we haven't attacked. We call them to Islam, which is surrender. But they treat it as a joke. They laughed until I threatened them. At the Apostle's command, I was the first to march beneath his flag, a victorious banner from Allah. Even as they sullied forth, burning with rage, Allah frustrated their schemes. Abu Jal, a pagan businessman, responded to the first Muslim militants. Ishak, I am amazed at the causes of anger and folly at those who stir up strife by lying controversy. They abandon our father's ways. They come with lies to twist our mind. But even their lies cannot confound the wise. If you give up your raids, we will take you back, for you are our cousins, our kin. But they chose to believe Muhammad and became obstinately contentious. All their deeds became evil. As always, the Meccans understood Islam. Even Ishak believed. Ishak, the raid on Wadan was the first Maghazi. He said, The expedition of Ubaida Harith was second. The apostle sent Ubaida out on a raid with sixty or eighty riders from the immigrants, there not being a single Ansar among them. He encountered a large number of Quraysh in the Hijaz. Abu Bakr composed a poem about the raid. Some of the most memorable lines include, When we called them to the truth, they turned their backs and howled like bitches. Allah's punishment on them will not tarry. I swear by the Lord of Camels, I assume he's speaking of Allah, that I am no perjurer. A valiant band will descend upon the Quraysh, which will leave women husbandless. It will leave men dead with vultures wheeling round. It will not spare the infidels. To which a pagan named Slave to Allah replied, Ishak, does your eye weep unceasingly over the ruins of a dwelling? This would be Allah's house. That the shifting sands obscure? Is your army and declaration of war firm enough that we should abandon images venerated in Mecca, passed on to heirs by a noble ancestor? That noble ancestor was Kusay. Are your steeds panting at the fray? Are your swords polished white? Are they in the hands of warriors, dangerous as lions? Or are you conceited? Are you here to quench your thirst for vengeance? Nay, they withdraw in great fear and awe. Of the raid, the historian reports, Tabati, eight months after the Hijra, Allah's messenger entrusted a white war banner to Ubaida and ordered him to march to Batan Rabig. He reached the pass of Mara near Jufa at the head of sixty emigrants without a single Ansari, or Medina Muslim, among them. They met the polytheists at a watering place called Aya. They shot arrows at one another, but there was no hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Prophet is now a repeat offender. Eight months into the Islamic era, and he has ordered multiple attacks. Muslim apologists profess that Muhammad was forced into defending Islam, and that he was neither aggressor, pirate, nor terrorist. But that position is indefensible. Nothing is known about the Muhammad of history. No independent records exist. All that is known about him is contained in these hadith. If they say he attacked a civilian caravan and then ordered men to march and fight in another town, he did. Therefore, he was the aggressor. There isn't even a hint of self-defense in these traditions, nor do they try to explain away the prophet's motives. They were after money, not armies, booty, not converts. You may be wondering why none of the Ansari joined the Muslim immigrants from Mecca on either of these raids. I believe the answer is that they hadn't been Muslims long enough, and therefore they still knew right from wrong. Islam had already corrupted the Meccan Muslims to the point that they thought piracy and terror were justifiable, even admirable. Kind of reminds us of modern-day Islamic terrorists. Ishak. Then the apostle went raiding in the month of Rabi'ul-Awal, 
making for the Quraysh. He turned to Medina without fighting. Then he raided the Quraysh by way of Dinar. Tabari. In this year, the messenger entrusted to Saad a white war banner for the expedition of Karar. Saad said, I set out on foot at the head of twenty men. We used to lie hidden by day and march at night, until we reached Karar on the fifth morning. The caravan had arrived in town a day before. There were sixty men with it. Those who were with Saad were all emigrants. Mohammed is now a serial offender, a committed pirate and terrorist, albeit a failed one. Tabari The messenger of Allah went out on a raid as far as Wadan, searching for the Quraysh, in the course of which the Banu Damra made a treaty of friendship with him. Then Muhammad returned to Mecca without any fighting and remained there for the rest of the month. This time Muhammad took command himself, with the express intent of finding the Quraysh and robbing them. And while it is noble that he inked a treaty of friendship, even this was the wrong thing for a prophet to do. Treaties are political, not religious. Muhammad was now considered a fellow chief, commanding a band of armed men, hardly prophet-like. And besides, the Quran would ultimately say that treaties with unbelieving infidels weren't binding on Muslims. This alliance was with pagans. Tabari. During this stay, he sent Ubaida at the head of sixty horsemen from the immigrants without a single Ansari among them. He got as far as the watering place in Hijaz, which is central Arabia, below the pass of Mara. There he met a band of Quraysh, but there was no fighting except Saad shot an arrow. Then the two groups separated from one another, the Muslims leaving a rear guard. Islamic raiders marched with the intent to plunder and kill. The only thing that stopped them from achieving their objective was the sight of a superior force. As we seek to defend ourselves today, we would do well to keep this in mind. Tabari Muhammad led an expedition in the month of Rabi al-Akhir in search of the Quraysh. He went as far as Buat in the region of Radwa, and then returned without any fighting. Then he led another expedition in search of the Meccans. He took the mountain track and crossed the desert, halting beneath a tree in Matha. He prayed there. What on earth was he praying for? Oh, God, please help me rob and kill these people. Thank you. Amen. After a few days, the prophet went out in pursuit of the Quds. The Islamic era was but a year old, yet Muslims were fully committed to the path of piracy and terror. Forget for a moment that this was supposed to be a religion. There was nothing noble, moral, or redeeming about raiding parties seeking to plunder civilian caravans or expeditions marching off to terrorize unsuspecting villagers. Just as there was no redeeming surah in Mecca, there is no virtuous behavior in Medina. I haven't cherry-picked the ugly parts out of a sea of religious activities. I have reported everything. The second year of the Islamic era began as the first one ended. The opening headline reads, Tabari, Expeditions led by Allah's Messenger. This was followed by, In this year, according to all Sira writers, the messenger personally led the Ghazwa of Alwa. A Ghazwa is an Islamic invasion, and Allah's cause, consisting of a large army unit, led by the Prophet himself. He left Saad in command of Medina. On this raid, his banner was carried by Hamza. He stayed out for fifteen days and then returned to Medina. This was the eighth failed terrorist attack in as many months. There are two interesting subtleties here. First, Saad, Chairman Mohammed's most fierce warrior, was left in command of Medina because the Prophet had become a warlord. And considering the nature of the Islamic world today, that made him a role model. Second, the religion of Islam actually coined a word to define an armed raid personally led by its Prophet. There's something very perverse about that. According to Wikidi, the messenger went out on a Ghazwa raid at the head of two hundred of his companions in October 623 and reached Buat. His intention was to intercept a Quraysh caravan with a hundred men and twenty-five hundred camels. This expedition was neither a military operation nor was it defensive. 
and it most assuredly wasn't religious. It was an act of terrorism against a civilian economic activity. And the pirate was after booty. The Hadith reports, In this year, Muhammad set forth the immigrants to intercept a Quraysh caravan en route to Syria. His war banner was carried by Hamza. It also failed. The score was Muslim militants zero, infidels ten. Unfortunately, Islam would get far better at this game than they ever got at religion. Ishak and Tabari Ali and I were with the messenger on the Ghazwa at Ushera. We halted on one occasion and saw some men of the Banu Mudi working in one of their date groves. I said, why don't we go and see how they work? So we went and watched them for a while. Then we felt drowsy and went to sleep on the dusty ground under the trees. Muhammad woke us, arriving as we were covered in dust. He stirred Ali with his foot and said, Arise, O dusty one! Shall I tell you who was the most wretched man? Amar of Thamud, for he slaughtered the she-camel, and he shall strike you here. Muhammad put his hand on the side of Ali's head until he was soaked from it. Then he grabbed his beard. The Quran claims that the Thamudic nation was destroyed by Allah because someone hamstrung a camel. While it's odd that he liked camels more than men, there's a bigger perversion still in this tale of misplaced ambition. The Muslims were so unfamiliar with honest labor, they went to watch someone work. And they were so lazy, they fell asleep while they were doing it. Ultimately, that is why the pirates were there in the first place. When the bedraggled Muslim refugees migrated north, they became dependent upon handouts. They were physically able to do work, since they went off on terrorist raids, and the oasis town of Yathrib was a bustling agricultural and commercial center, so there was plenty of work being done. All of which leads to a conclusion. Something in Islam made the Muslims unwilling to work, and it affects them to this day. Islamic states have the lowest per capita productivity of any nations in the world. Islam politically and economically is as faulty as the religion is false. It's lose-lose. Ishak. Meanwhile, the apostle sent Saad on the raid of Abu Waqqas. The prophet only stayed a few nights in Medina before raiding Ushera and then Kurs. Let's review Bukhari's book of Makazi to get a better feel for what's happening. Bukhari. Allah's apostles said, A time will come when a group of Muslims will wage holy war, and it will be said, Is there anyone who has accompanied Allah's apostle? They will say, Yes. And so a victory will be bestowed upon them. The apostle said, Tomorrow I will give the flag to a man whose leadership Allah will use to grant a Muslim victory. I fought in seven Ghazwat battles along with the Prophet, and fought in nine Maghazi raids in armies dispatched by the Prophet. There was nothing spiritual about fundamental Islam. Bukhari. I heard Saad saying, I was the first Arab to shoot an arrow in Allah's cause. I witnessed a scene that was dearer to me than anything I had ever seen. Aswad came to the Prophet while Muhammad was urging Muslims to fight the pagans. He said, We shall fight on your right and on your left, and in front of you and behind you. I saw the face of the Prophet getting bright with happiness, for that saying delighted him. Bukhari The believers who did not join in the Ghazwa and those who fought are not equal in reward. Allah's apostle said, When your enemy comes near, shoot at them, but use your arrow sparingly, so that they are not wasted. Allah's wrath became severe on anyone the Prophet killed in Allah's cause. While the terrorist raids were hardly religious, religious symbolism and rewards were used to solicit and inspire the new combatants. Bukhari Muhammad led the fear prayer with one batch of his army, while the other batch faced the enemy. Bukhari, the prophet said, This is Gabriel holding the head of his horse, equipped with arms for battle. Allah's apostle used to say, None has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, because he has honored his warriors and made his messengers victorious. 
He alone defeated the infidel clans, so there is nothing left. Bukhari, a man came to the prophet and said, Can you tell me where I will go if I get martyred? The prophet replied, To paradise. The man fought till he was martyred. There are no such bargains in Yahweh's scriptures. Killing is not an express ticket to heaven. Yeshua never asked his followers to slay anyone. The Messiah mentions killing only once. He tells a parable about a ruler in the final days of the tribulation to encourage his followers to be productive, not destructive. Allah especially hated Christians and Jews, ordering Muslims to fight them until they were wiped out to the last. This is fundamental Islam, the very core of Muhammad's message. That said, there is one Bible verse that appears to be both open-ended and to encourage violence. As such, Psalm 149 became the rallying cry for the Crusades. In actuality, it's prophetic, speaking of what's called the Tribulation and of the return of the Messiah. In the fashion of Hebrew poetry, the psalm presents a series of nine couplets, pairs of phrases that say the same thing, but in different words. Let's review them. The first couplet speaks prophetically of the new millennium, of the church and of saints. Praise Yahweh, sing unto Yahweh a fresh song, and sing His praise in the congregation of saints. The second celebrates the end of the tribulation and the Messiah's return. Let Israel rejoice in Yahweh who made them. Let the children of Israel be joyful in their king. Then, let them praise Yahweh's character and dance. Let them sing praises unto Yahweh with the tambourine and harp. Speaking of the Messiah's gift of salvation, the next reports, For Yahweh is pleased with his people. He will glorify the meek with salvation. The fifth couplet reveals, let the saints be joyful in this glorious honor. Let them shout from their resting place. At the Messiah's return, the souls of the saints will be raised from their graves. A Catholic pope misinterpreted the sixth verse to advance his personal agenda. Let the exaltation of the Almighty be in their mouths, and a two-edged sword be in their open hand. A two-edged sword is the Bible's metaphor for divine judgment, or for rendering a godly verdict. That's why it's in an open hand, which could not wield an instrument of violence. Its pair in the couplet references the exalted words of the Almighty, suggesting an oral verdict, not a slashing weapon. The seventh pair proclaims, to advance vengeance upon the nations, and punishment upon the people. This speaks to the final judgment of Yahweh, on those who attack Israel during World War III, midway through the tribulation. It's interesting in that the predicted Magog war against Israel is perpetrated entirely by Muslims. This is followed by, to yoke kings together, bringing them forth, and those who are severe will be tied with iron twine. In other words, following God's verdict, the purveyors of false doctrines, those who are severe, will be restrained. The final couplet reveals, to advance the verdict upon them, prescribed by the splendor of the saints. Praise Yahweh. The entire psalm is prophetic, speaking of the final judgment of nations following the Messiah's return in power and glory. There is no command to fight or kill anyone. Since Islam's principal defense is to claim that Christians have performed no better, especially during the Crusades, I want to bring your attention to two incredibly important historical facts. First, Pope Benedict IX. He reigned in 1033 A.D., precisely 1,000 years after Christ's resurrection. Benedict became like Mohammed, demonic, fixated on the occult, demented, delirious, and lascivious. The church became corrupt, focused on rituals, suppression, and money. With power-hungry men at the helm, it splintered, ultimately causing cleric and king to send men off on foolhardy crusades. The second historical fact is that the crusaders weren't Christians. They couldn't have been, 
Four centuries had passed since the last sermon was given in a language common to the people of Europe. The first Bible to be printed in the vulgar tongue was John Wycliffe's, yet it wouldn't find quill for another four centuries. To be a Christian, one must know Christ. He could not have been known to the men who fought. They carried his symbols, nothing more. Returning to the 7th century in Medina, Muhammad was back on the warpath. Tabari and Ishak. The messenger sent Abd Allah out with a detachment of eight men of the immigrants without any Ansari or helpers among them. He wrote a letter but ordered him not to look at it until he had traveled for two days. Then he was to carry out what he was commanded to do. When Abd Allah opened the letter, it said, March until you reach Nakla between Mecca and Taif. Lie in wait for the Quraysh there, and find out for us what they are doing. The letter suggests that there was treachery among the treacherous. One or more Muslims was spilling the beans and tipping off the Quraysh before the militants could rob them. Having read the letter, Abdallah said, To hear is to obey. He told his companions, the prophet commanded me to go to Nakla and lie in wait for the Quraysh. To lie in wait is an order to kill. I present Allah as an authority. Here is Quran 9.5. When the prohibited months for fighting are over, slay the pagans wherever you find them. Take them captive and besiege them. Lie in wait for them in every likely place. Abd Allah tells his fellow militants, the prophet has forbidden me to compel you, so whoever desires martyrdom, let him come with me. If not, retreat. I am going to carry out the prophet's orders. Martyrdom, the word that manufactures terrorists faster than the world can rid itself of them, was spoken for the first time. No word has ever held such dire consequences for abused or abuser. The Islamic concept of martyrdom was twisted. Muhammad took a good word and made it bad. Prior to Islam, a martyr willingly sacrificed his or her life to save others, not killed them. A Christian martyr sought nothing. Their lives served as a living witness so that others might know the value of their faith. They died with scripture in their hands, not swords. The Greek word martus, from which martar was derived, means witness. Yet at Muhammad's direction it came to mean murderer. Muslims obtained martyrdom by terrorizing others, murdering millions. Muslim martyrs are mercenaries, wielding swords in pursuit of plunder. I believe this is Satan's signature once again. He is the world's most acclaimed counterfeiter. Martyrdom is good, but not as a pirate. Money is good, but not when it's plundered. Sex is good, but not as an act of pedophilia. Prophets are good, but not when they are motivated by profit. Scripture is good, but not when it's perverted. Prayer is good, but not when one prostrates oneself to the devil. Ishak. His companions went with him. Not one of them stayed behind. A second hadith says... Whoever desires death, let him go on and make his will. I am making my will, and acting on the orders of the Messenger of Allah. Tabari. They made their way through the Hijaz, until Saad and Utba lost a camel, which they were taking turns riding. They stayed behind to look for it. The rest went on until they reached Nakla. A Meccan caravan went past them, carrying raisins, leather, and other merchandise, which the Quraysh traded. When they saw the Muslims, they were afraid of them. Then one of the Muslims came into view. They saw that he had shaved his head, and they felt safer. The Quraysh said, They are on their way to the Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. There is nothing to fear. The pagan Umrah had become part of Islam. However, shaving one's head was used to venerate a lot, not Allah. So the Quraysh were confused as I am. Why would a Muslim militant venerate a pagan idol while pursuing plunder in Allah's name? Ishak, the Muslim raiders consulted one another concerning them, this being the last day of Rajab. 
Rajab, like Ramadan, was a holy month on the pagan calendar. Fighting, looting, and general mayhem were prohibited. It is troubling that the observance of a pagan rite was a limiting factor, while thievery and murder were not. This says a great deal about the nature of Islam. One of the Muslims said, By Allah, if we leave these people alone tonight, they will get into the Haram, the sacred territory of Mecca, and they will be safely out of our reach. If we kill them, we will have killed in the sacred month. The debate was between paganism and criminal behavior. Islam had nothing to do with Muhammad's mission. Tabari. They hesitated and were afraid to advance on them, but then they plucked up courage and agreed to kill as many as they could and to seize what they had with them. This isn't the least bit ambiguous. The first Muslims, Muhammad's disciples, were about to conduct a terrorist raid with the intent to loot and to kill. Waqid ibn Abdallah shot an arrow at Amar and killed him. Uthman bin Abdallah and al-Hakam surrendered. But Nafal ibn Abdallah escaped and eluded them. Then Abdallah and his companions took the caravan and the captives back to Allah's apostle in Medina. Islam had drawn first blood. The score was now Islam 1, infidels 11. The Hadith says, This was the first booty taken by the companions of Muhammad. Reading the passage carefully, we find that there are four slaves to Allah in the raid. Two were Muslims, and two were infidels. It is yet another drop in an ocean of evidence that Allah was a pagan deity, a common rock idol. Abd Allah said of his adventure, Ishak, our lances drank of Amr's blood and lit the flame of war. Tabari and Ishak. Abdallah told his companions, A fifth of the booty we have taken belongs to the apostle. This was before Allah made surrendering a fifth of the booty taken a requirement. Quran 8.41, a verse from a surah dedicated to booty, says that Muhammad was entitled to one-fifth of whatever Muslims looted. The 69th verse proclaims, The use of such spoils is lawful and good. The fact Abd Allah announced this partitioning of booty years in advance of the Quranic endorsement suggests that the idea was Muhammad's, and that he made up a verse to ratify his claim. Money is a powerful motivator. He set aside a fifth of the booty for Allah's messenger, and divided the rest between his companions. Allah made the booty permissible. He divided the loot, awarding four-fifths to the men he had allowed to take it. He gave one-fifth to his apostle. If there were any doubt as to why the first Muslim militants were off on their twelfth raid in twelve months, it should have been eliminated with this line. Their mission had nothing to do with religion, nor did Muhammad's. It had always been about the money. Religion was simply a tool, a veil, a distraction, a means to legitimize murder and mayhem. Muhammad's raiders weren't religious zealots. They were mercenaries at best, pirates at worst. And lest we forget, they were now murderers, kidnappers, and thieves. When the raiders returned to Yathrib, they were blindsided by a raging controversy. Both the immigrants and the helpers were horrified, deeply troubled by the breach of the holy month protections. Even the most despicable bandits refrained from thievery during Rajab. And I suppose they may have been bothered by the fact that they had murdered robbed and kidnapped their kin. This societal disdain put the wannabe prophet in a quandary. Muhammad was broke, and poor dictators don't last very long. But if he accepted the booty, he would trash his already shaky religious credentials. He was on his heels and teetering from the Karish bargain, the satanic verses, the night's journey, and the migration of shame. Stooping to the level of a scoundrel, a murderous pirate, a two-bit terrorist, so desperate for money that he would steal during Rajab, was one blow too many. So what to do? His first ploy was to betray his troops, something Muslim suicide bombers should keep in mind the next time they contemplate murdering their way to paradise. Tabari 
When they reached the prophet, he said, I did not order you to fight in the sacred month. He impounded the caravan and the two captives and refused to take anything from them. The prospect of martyrdom and lying in wait confirms that Muhammad had sent his Muslim raiders out to fight, as did the requirement of making out their wills. The division of spoils agreement indicates that he had given his authorization for them to steal. The lying prophet was buying time, which is why he didn't send the booty back. He was trying to find a way to keep the money and maintain his dwindling prestige. When Allah's messengers said this, they were aghast and thought that they were doomed. The Muslims rebuked them severely for what they had done. They said, You have done what you were not commanded to do, and have fought in the sacred month. To salvage his reputation, and thus cling to his position of power, Muhammad made his men scapegoats. His letter confirmed his complicity. He had sent them out in Rajab, the idolater's sacred month. The act made him an accessory to murder and a thief. The denial made him a pagan and a liar something far more lethal to a person pretending to be a prophet. Tabari and Ishak The Quraysh said, Muhammad and his companions have violated the sacred month, shed blood, seized property, and taken men captive. The polytheists spread lying slander concerning him, saying, Muhammad claims that he is following obedience to Allah, yet he is the first to violate the holy month and to kill our companion in Rajab. The pagans knew that breaking treaties, murder, kidnapping, and thievery were wrong. It's a shame that Islam's lone prophet didn't. I find it especially revealing that when the Meccans told the truth about what had just happened, they were called lying slanderers. This has devastating implications for the totality of the Quran. Its second most repetitive theme is the never-ending argument. The Meccans said that Muhammad was a demon-possessed liar, not a prophet. They said that he had forged the Quran to serve his personal ambitions. They appeared to be right, and yet Islam's dark spirit called them lying slanderers. In this circumstance, the Meccans were absolutely right, and yet Muhammad deployed the same strategy. At the very least, this suggests that the Hadith and Quran had the same speechwriter, the same agenda, and the same wanton disregard for truth. It also tells us that those who knew this prophet far better than we could possibly know him today saw him as a terrorist raider, an immoral thug, and as a liar. Tabari, the Muslims who were still in Mecca refuted this. It was embarrassing. It meant that they had placed their trust in a man unworthy of it. Ishak, The Jews, seeing in this an omen unfavorable to Muhammad, said, Muslims killing Meccans means war is kindled. There was much talk of this. However, Allah turned it to their disadvantage. When the Muslims repeated what the Jews had said, Allah revealed a Quran to his messenger. They question you with regard to warfare in the sacred month. Say, war therein is serious, but keeping people from Islam, from the sacred month, and driving them out is more serious with Allah. This became Quran 2, 217. The Muslims now knew that seduction was worse than killing. Considering the facts, this was an inane excuse for violating treaties, kidnapping, theft, and murder. The Meccan merchants were minding their business. They weren't seducing anyone. Once again, the prophet behaves badly, and it's the pagan's fault, not his own. Ishak, when the Quran passage concerning this matter was revealed and Allah relieved Muslims of their fear and anxiety, Muhammad took possession of the caravan and prisoners. The Quraysh sent him a ransom, but the prophet said, we will not release them to you on payment of ransom until our companions, Saad and Utbah, get back, for we are afraid you may harm them. If you kill them, we will kill your friends. They came back, however, and the Prophet released the prisoners on payment of ransom. When the Quran authorization came down to Muhammad, Abdallah and his companions were relieved because 
and they became anxious for an additional reward. They said, Will this raid be counted as part of the reward promised to Muslim combatants? So Allah sent down this Quran. Those who believe and have fought in Allah's cause may receive Allah's mercy. Allah made the booty permissible. He divided the loot, awarding four-fifths to the men he had allowed to take it. He gave one-fifth to his apostle. Mercy for murderers. Rewards for raiders. Loot for profiteers. Allah's cause has been defined for the first time, and is directly linked to a terrorist raid, one in which Muslim militants attacked civilians. They committed capital murder, kidnapping, and armed robbery. Islam was not preached. Instead, Islam was used to motivate the bandits and reward the prophet. The religion prompted barbarism rather than discourage it. This incident alone destroys Islam's religious credentials, Muhammad's authority, and Allah's credibility. God justifying criminal acts to satisfy a prophet's financial lust is unfathomable. If we are to believe Muhammad, Allah approved murder terror, thievery, and kidnapping for ransom. Forget for a moment that this dark spirit was demented. This is immoral. An immoral God cannot be trusted, and a moral deity isn't worthy of a religion, devotion, sacrifice, or martyrdom. The same is true of an immoral prophet. Muhammad had sent out armed brigades in search of Quraysh, hoping to terrorize them and rob their caravans. When his militants succeeded, he betrayed his mercenaries to save his own hide, yet he still took the money. He threatened to kill his kin and ransom them back to his tribe. Then he claimed that his God approved his hellish behavior, which is the biggest crime of all. The only thing more devastating than a man professing situational scriptures to legitimize terror, murder, robbery, and kidnapping for ransom is to lure billions to their doom by implying these words were inspired by God. By so doing, Muhammad confirmed my theory. Islam was nothing more than the profitable prophet plan. According to the Sirah, Muhammad was a con man. There have been millions of murderers, millions of kidnappers, millions of terrorists. There have been millions of sexual predators. Thieves are a dime a dozen. There have been a score of men who have done these things while claiming to be anointed by God. Yet only one invented a religion and falsified scripture to satiate his demonic cravings. This is why Muhammad, Islam's lone prophet, qualifies as the most evil man to have ever lived.